able to tell. If you're a guest in our service, we're glad that you're here today. We don't do this every Sunday, but everything's going to have a reason here in a bit. But we're glad you're here. Please take a guest card and fill that out and return it to us during our time of offering this morning. What we hope to do this morning is to recreate a bit of a medieval worship service that would give you a flavor of what it was like to attend worship before the Reformation. We want you to get a sense of the surroundings, a sense of the room, and your participation, what your participation would have been prior to the Reformation. St. Telio's Church in England has a thing they call the worship experience in which they have gone back and reenacted medieval worship services. And you're going to see video clips of these reenactments playing during the service. But during the service, you'll also see Abby and Stephen behind the screen. Abby will be serving as our priest this morning. Stephen will be serving as our deacon. They came to that decision because Stephen wanted to handle the incense. And so that is how those distinctions were made. You'll notice in the video that it takes about a half a dozen people to service the work of the priest. Stephen will be doing that by himself this morning, which means this may be the first time you've ever seen a youth minister overworked and underpaid. (laughs) We also want to say this morning that we are in no way belittling or criticizing medieval worship. We are in no way making a comment upon our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Catholic Church. You cannot go anywhere in the Western world and find this service practiced on a regular basis. If you see this service practiced, it will be because it is a reenactment. There are elements of this service that no one practices in the world. After the Reformation, the Catholic Church said, you know, we may need to pay attention to some of these changes. And they began the painful process of the Counter-Reformation, which lasted until the late 1500s, until 1962 with the Declaration of Vatican II you will not find this service practiced anywhere among any congregation. What I want you to see this morning is this screen. These look similarly familiar, very familiar to the screens that we use in the fellowship hall from time to time. But these are our, these are our rude screens, R-O-O-D. In the medieval church, these were set up to separate the chancel, which contains the altar, from the nave, where the people are. This rude screen separates the holy from the common. And though some of you are sitting in a place where you'll be able to see Abby and Stephen moving through these screens, others of you are sitting in a place where you can't see anything on the stage. This picture you see before you is a picture I took in York, England of the rude screen in the York Minster. It is carved in stone And it is the kings of England from William the Conqueror to Henry VI. It's very ornate and no one's moving it. The next picture you see is a rude screen that you might find in a rural congregation. Caleb, can we put that one up? A rural congregation, it's it's rather simple. It's made from wood. But in this case, you can see through it. The third screen more likely resembles a medieval rude screen. The congregation would be out front and have only a very restricted, limited view of the holy things taking place on the stage. So with that, let us call the people to worship. In a world without clocks, worshipers were called to the church by the ringing of the church bell. And as the worshipers enter the worship center, you can see that the women will stop, wash their hands and cleanse themselves, and then move over to the left side of the, of the room. The men, while few in number, will enter the building without cleansing themselves and move to the right. Men and women were not together during worship. The only two people, you men and women, you'll see standing beside each other in the video is the Lord and the Lady of the Manor, and you can tell who they are by their extravagant dress. I'll give you a moment to see if you can spot the other 
glaring omission in the video. There are no seats. Medieval worship did not have seats in the building. Worshippers came and stood or sat on the stone floor. This worship service you're watching takes 64 minutes to execute and has a, has a liturgy pages of seven, has 76 liturgy pages with it. But the worshipers stood or sat on the stone floor for that hour. We move forward now about 15 minutes into the service. The acolytes, the deacons have prepared the altar and they've carried a copy of the liturgy and the Latin Vulgate to the altar. It's been cleansed with incense three times. They've greeted one another with a holy kiss, offered prayers, and brought in the bread and the cup to the altar. You'll notice as the priest makes his way to the altar, he never faces the people. The priest's back will always be away from the people and toward the altar. Theologically, he would say, we are leading the people toward God and not speaking toward the people. You'll also notice as the service progresses, the members, congregants, gatherers talk a lot. Historians tell us that while the holy things were going on behind the rude screen, the business of the community is going on in the nave. People are visiting about raising children, about crops, about doing business. They're talking about their animals. They're visiting back and forth during the, the, the service. It's as almost as if things could happen without the people even being present. We come now to a moment of ceremonial washing. The priest, the deacons are gonna wash their hands and prepare the altar. But during this time, Robert is gonna come and give us a flavor of the music of the day. You're hearing some authentic plain song or plain chant or Gregorian chant. Um, there were songs included in every medieval worship service. Uh, they were mostly scripture. They were part of a, a body of work that included hundreds if not thousands of songs that had been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. The first song we will look at today um, is a song that is called the Kyrie. Uh, the Kyrie Eleison is a song that goes back to Jewish worship. It's the only one of the songs that were included in the worship service in those days that was not in Latin. The rest of them were in Latin. This is in Greek. And I'll sing an excerpt for you in just a minute. But you'll notice some things about these songs. First of all, they're always sung only by men. They were only sung without accompaniment. No organ is playing. Now, you'll hear an organ later, but it's just playing background music. It would not accompany the singing. You may have heard of the term a cappella, and we have brethren in other denominations that worship a cappella, they say. Well, a cappella is a medieval term in Latin that means for the chapel. And so music for the chapel was a cappella. It was unaccompanied always. Another thing about it, uh, it was always sung in unison or with a melody only. No parts, no alto or soprano uh, or tenor. Always again in Latin. And these songs were not just uh, what the song leader might have picked that day. You know, I heard this on the radio. Maybe it, it would be a good one to use. They were songs that were approved and again were many, many hundreds of years old usually. Now, they sound strange to us, but they didn't always sound old. They weren't always old. They sound like a foreign language to us, but Latin was actually the language of commerce all across Europe for many, many years. When it stopped being used, of course, then it was a dead language, and it, nobody could understand it unless they had studied it. 
But uh, that's one of the things about tradition. Sometimes they go on awfully long. So, Lord have mercy. Here is a, an excerpt of this. It's usually done nine times, but we will only do it three. And by the way, the early Christians called Jesus Lord. But after a few years, they realized some people thought they were just singing the old Jewish Lord, meaning God the Father. So they added to Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Christ have mercy. Kyrie eleison, Christe Another song that was included in every service, no matter what time of year, when other things would change, the Kyrie was there, the Agnus Dei was also there. That means behold the Lamb. And the Agnus Dei is uh, based on John 1.29, where John the Baptist sees Jesus coming, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Well, the full text of that song that uh, was always sung is, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on me. And then at the end, give me peace. On your stay, quitolis peccata mundi. Agnus Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis, dona nobis pace. And this last sample song that you would hear would only be done on around Easter. It was not uh, it was not used in every mass by any means. It was something special, and it is not scripture. It is uh, actually a hymn like what we sing, a poem set to music. But it had been done for many years when uh, the church began to change things at the Council of Trent, the Roman Church. They threw out lots and lots of old music. And of a certain type of music, they threw all of them out except four. Hundreds of them said, these are no longer useful. We're not going to sing them anymore. This Victime Pascali Laudis was one of the four they kept. And it's a, it's a popular song even today. The melody may even be familiar to you. The words are, praise to the... Passover lamb who has taken away our sins and reconciled us to Christ. Victime Pascali Lades Immolent Christiani Agnus Redemi Christus innocens patri reconciliavit peccatores. Thank you, Robert. We now turn to the incensing of the altar. Incense was to believed to purify the air. It chased away the evil spirits. It cleansed what is common and made it holy by its presence. 
And I would remind you, as you're watching the video, you are seeing camera angles that would have never been seen in the medieval world. We move now to the most important part of the service. You're going to hear two bells. The first bell is to call your attention that the most important thing is about to happen. In a, language, in a time when people didn't speak Latin, the bell was the signal, pay attention. The second bell, we'll see we'll be after the priest has spoken the most eight important words. Speaking on behalf of Christ, he will say, this is my body and the bread will become the body of Christ. He will say, this is my blood, and the, blood, the, the juice, the wine, will become the blood of Christ.
actually this corpus of some ways. But uh, this might be too dumb a question. Is it? You would assume at this point in the service that they would move from the, the blessing of the Eucharist to taking the bread and the wine. But as I told you earlier, this is a mass for the Lady Mary. And they now take a moment to venerate Mary by taking a picture that has been blessed and they will pass it around. Stephen has a photo frame here. We figured this was a bridge too far to start asking you to kiss a picture frame. <laughs> In an age of consciousness of germs, we'll not do that, but it is a central key in the medieval worship. When the picture is returned, it is placed upon the altar and the priest will now take the bread and the wine. You'll find it striking in this video. Go ahead, Caleb, that in this video, only the priest takes the bread and the wine. Only that it is holy behind the screen is allowed to take the body and the blood of Christ.
Following the taking of the bread and the wine, you'll notice that they began to clean up a bit. There are more prayers. There are more ceremonial acts. There are more things going on in the service. But let's skip now to the conclusion of the service. priests went one way and the people went another way and the service was complete. You'll notice the only participation of the people were that of the kissing of the picture frame of Mary as they passed it around the congregation. They were completely separate from the people. After the Reformation, Luther in Germany, Calvin in Geneva, Zwingli in Zurich began to wrestle with this idea, if the church is the people of God, should not the people be more involved in the worship of God? Should the people have their worship done for them, or should the people be involved in the worship? And so Luther started doing revolutionary things. He took common tunes that people knew and he set Christian words to them and they began to sing these words in church. Luther introduced congregational singing. The second thing that Luther did was he introduced preaching into the worship services. If the people were going to live the word of God, they need to hear the word of God. And you have a picture here of the castle church in Wittenberg after the Reformation. They built the pulpit on the dividing line between the chancel and the nave. And Luther climbed up into that pulpit and he stood below that sounding board and he said to them, hear the word of the Lord from Romans, from Galatians, from the Gospels. And the people heard the word of the Lord preached in their own language for the first time in a thousand years. Luther also began to sep draw the line between clergy and laity. He removed the demarcation of clergy from laity. And the clergy began to wear the clothes of the people and act as if they were part of the people and communicate with the people. Luther changed the way the church related to its people. And I probably don't have to tell you this again. Luther's the one who brought seats into the sanctuary. You would have stood for 64 minutes in this particular service or sat on a stone floor until Luther came along and said, let us put seats so people can hear the word of the Lord. But for our purposes this morning, the most important thing Luther did was he removed the rude screens. The screens came away in the congregations of Europe and the people were allowed to see the altar. They were allowed to see the work of the preacher. They were allowed to see the, the Lord's Supper in presentation. And most importantly, they were allowed to participate in the Lord's Supper, which we're going to do in just a few moments. But I ask you now to stand as our choir comes. Stand and let's sing and celebrate the, giving, the, the blessings we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
You may be seated. It is with the Reformation that people were allowed to approach the altar for the first time in most of their lives, in all of their lives. You know, we've done this from time to time in our church. You've come forward and the deacons have had a personal word for you, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. When Eloise Wilson was alive, she used to give me a hard time. She would say, Stacy, you're trying to make Catholics out of us. I would say, no, Lou Eloise, I'm trying to make Reformation Christians out of them. Where do you think the Catholics learned it? They learned it from Luther. When Luther opened the altar and allowed the people to come forward and to receive the Lord's Supper. This morning, Frank is going to be our usher. Cyrus will be in the back. We're going to ask you to come forward this morning to one of our stations, and the deacons will have a word for you. We ask you to take the bread and drink the juice here at the station with the deacons. Reading now from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we celebrate the return to a New Testament faith some 500 years ago that we are believers who've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And we come before you taking this bread and drinking this juice, remembering your death and giving thanks. Father, I ask that you bless our observance this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to ask our deacon chairman is on call and has been hidden in the back. Joel is going to be coming forward. If you're unable to come forward, Joel will come to you with the bread and the juice this morning.
This morning we celebrate when the church was reopened by New Testament truth that all believers in Jesus Christ are welcome at the altar and are able to remember Christ and his sacrifice and his love for ourselves. We give you the chance this morning to choose faith in Jesus Christ, to stand before this congregation and the world and to say, yes, I believe. Those of you here looking for a church home, come and join with us as we seek to serve the Lord and minister in this community. May the Lord bless this time of commitment and may his spirit work among us as we stand and as we sing when I survey the wondrous cross and you come this morning.
Well, I definitely can't follow that, but I would like to remind you guys of Harvest Fest this week. This Wednesday, we're going to have our Harvest Fest over at the Activity Center. If you're able to come and use your car so that we can have trunk or treat, I ask that you be over there at 530. That way we can go ahead and get all the cars in before people start coming. We don't want to run over any little kids. Our youth kids, that would be bad. That would be really bad. But our youth kids are going to be running the fall festival inside. They always do a great job of that and we'll have lots of different things. I also need lots of cupcakes for our cupcake walk. So if you have some spare time and you enjoy baking or are a mediocre baker like myself, then please bring me some cupcakes. You can bring those up to the church anytime this week and I'll make sure they make their way over to the activity center. It's going to be a great time and I really hope that everybody will come out so that we can just show our community um, what we do and that we love them. So I'll see y'all Wednesday. Thank you, Abby. It's always a good time when the children of our community come to us on the Wednesday night before Halloween for the Trunk or Treat and the Harvest Fest, and I hope that you'll take time to participate with us. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to some folks. I, I hatched, I, we've been planning for about six months what we wanted to do for the Reformation. You know, I am a church historian. I thought about doing a PhD in church history and we went down the went down and made discussions in that but I, I I wanted to convey somehow the radical change that came with the reformation and last summer I started visiting with Robert about how can we how can we communicate to people how different the world was before Luther came along I mean we're used to gorilla glass came out on this year's iPhone and then next year, it's going to have a different kind of button on it. And it's supposed to change the world. Luther's Reformation literally changed the world. It changed how people related to God. It changed how they worshiped. And it changed how they related to one another. And we wanted this morning to somehow convey before and after. And I want to thank a music minister who puts up with all of my crazy ideas to... Uh, <laughs> To work, to work with me and to work with me patiently. And Abby and Stephen, who didn't really know what they were signing up for, who have rehearsed and practiced and went through the motions to try and create a sense of being in a service where the priest and the deacons are isolated from the congregation. So Stephen and Abby, thank you all very much. And thank you all for letting me try a few new things every now and then. May God bless you. Let's stand together for our closing song, and may we go out celebrating that we are the people of God.